Okay, so we're going to solve this equation. And if you look carefully, you'll spot that x equals 1 is a solution. Then if you look even more carefully, you'll also spot that x equals 0 works too. So we've got some solutions to the equation. But the difficult part is trying to find more solutions or show that there are no other solutions. And if you were to take a purely algebraic approach here, it would be extremely difficult to solve this. But what we'll do instead is we'll turn solutions to this equation into roots of a certain function. So let's define f of x as 4x squared minus 3 to the x minus 6x plus 5 to the x. So if you've got a value of x where f of x is 0, this corresponds to a solution to our equation. And what we'll do is we'll have a look at the graph of this function and its properties to tell us more about the roots of this function and hence the solutions of our equation. So we know that we've got some roots at 0 and 1. So now the question is, do we have maybe some behaviour like this, or are there some other roots as well? And to get an idea on what our graph looks like, whether it's got just these two roots or whether it's got more, we'll have a look at the derivative of this function, because these turning points are related to the behaviour of this. The derivative can tell us a lot about what the graph looks like. So f dash of x, when we differentiate this, we get 8x minus ln3 times 3 to the x, minus 6, then plus ln5 times 5 to the x. So if you wanted to find all of the turning points here, you'd set this equal to 0, but unfortunately that's probably not going to be very helpful because solving this is about as difficult as solving the original equation. So what we could do instead is look at the second derivative, because this still contains a lot of information about what our graph will look like. So the second derivative now is 8 minus, then we've got ln3 squared, times 3 to the x. The 6 disappears when we differentiate, then plus ln5 squared times 5 to the x. So now this looks quite promising to me, because the second derivative here, if we look carefully, this looks like it's actually always going to be positive. So we've got this 8, then when x is very small, when it's negative, these two terms will be very small, and when x is large, this term will be very big. So it looks like actually the second derivative is always going to be positive. So we'll introduce this as a claim that we'll prove later. So we're going to claim that the second derivative of our function is greater than zero for all values of x. But before we prove this, we'll just have a look in a bit more detail at why this is going to be useful. So given that our second derivative is always positive, this tells us a lot about what the graph of our function looks like. If the second derivative is positive, this restricts the number of turning points that our function can have. And if we restrict the number of turning points that we have, this will also restrict the number of roots or the number of zeros of our function. So if we just take for granted for now, say given that f dash dash, the second derivative is always positive, let's assume for a contradiction now that f has at least three roots or at least three zeros. This is assuming for a contradiction we've got at least three solutions to this equation. So if we've got three roots, then just pictorially, what happens is we pass through the x-axis three times. And because this is a continuous function, if you want to draw continuously joining all of these, you'll get at least two turning points. So this is just a little proof by picture. But if you wanted to make this more rigorous, you could use Rolle's theorem or the mean value theorem to show that there have to be at least two turning points here. Okay, so if we've got at least two turning points, let's have a look now at what this says when we look at the graph of the first derivative, because we know that the second derivative is always positive. So if we were to draw a graph of the first derivative, this is an increasing function, because its derivative, the second derivative, is always positive. So if we just draw a graph of the first derivative, this can actually have at most one zero. So this doesn't seem to be a problem so far, but let's think, this means that f of x is equal to zero at most once, but this tells us that our original function, f, has at most one turning point, because you've got a turning point when the first derivative is equal to zero. So this is actually a contradiction, because we've just seen that we need to have at least two turning points if we've got at least three roots. So this contradicts our assumption that we've got at least three roots. So this tells us then that we've got two roots, zero and one, and hence zero and one would be our only solutions to this equation. So what we need to do now is prove that the second derivative is greater than zero for all x, and then this will tell us that we've only got two solutions to our equation. 
We'll prove this inequality by splitting up into two cases, where x is greater than or equal to zero, then we'll deal with the case where x is negative, because we get quite different behaviour either side of zero. So the second derivative of x is 8 minus ln 3 squared times 3 to the x plus ln 5 squared times 5 to the x. And what we'll do is we'll show that this is greater than something and then greater than something else and so on in a chain and eventually we'll show that it's all greater than zero. So we could start off, let's just say this ln 5 term, we know that this is greater than ln 3. So we can now get rid of ln 5, turn this into ln 3 and this will allow us to take out a factor. So this tells us now that the second derivative of f is greater than 8 minus ln 3 squared times 3 to the x plus ln 3 squared times 5 to the x. What we'll do is turn this into 8 plus ln 3 squared into 5 to the x minus 3 to the x. Okay, then from here you can see that 5 to the x minus 3 to the x, when x is greater than or equal to 0, 5 to the x is certainly going to be greater than or equal to 3 to the x. So this term is greater than or equal to 0. So we can just get rid of all of this now and say that all of this is greater than or equal to 8, which is certainly greater than 0. So we've shown that this inequality holds at least when x is greater than or equal to 0. So when x is negative, we use some slightly different bounds. So this term ln5 squared times 5 to the x, we know that this is always positive. And this is actually true regardless of x being positive or negative. So what we'll do here is we'll just completely disregard this term because that's greater than 0. This tells us our second derivative has to be greater than 8 minus ln3 squared times 3 to the x. So what we'll do now is deal with the ln3 term. So we can know that ln3, this is less than 2 because 3 is certainly less than e squared. This tells us that ln3 squared is less than 2 squared and minus ln3 squared then has to be greater than minus 2 squared and minus 4. So this tells us that our second derivative then is greater than 8 minus 4 times 3 to the x. So what do we do with the 3 to the x term? Well, when x is negative, this tells us that 3 to the x has to be less than 1. So minus 4 times 3 to the x has got to be greater than minus 4. So now our bound on the second derivative is 8 minus 4, which is equal to 4, and this is certainly greater than 0. So we've shown that the second derivative now is greater than 0 in both cases, so this is true for all x. So then this tells us that we only have two roots of our function f, and hence there are only two solutions, x is 0 and x is 1, to our original equation.